Pander, for your personal warmth, for your uh, generous expression of thanks. Uh, I'm grateful, and I'd like to express to uh, all of you who have uh, continued to return, or whether this is your first evening, it is a privilege to be able to uh, address people and to invite uh, us and each other to uh, think and uh, wrestle with the realities of contemporary life with a commitment to be faithful, to write good history uh, for the God of creation and the Christ of redemption. Uh, I've been enriched this week. Uh, I think I have talked more in a shorter period than uh, I can remember. Uh, I'm going to leave tired, uh, but uh, uh, motivated and with uh, good memories of uh, the campus for some dear friends who are here. And I trust that you will have a strong sense of God's presence as you chart your way through the uncertainty of the future, but with a sense of confidence. Uh, this evening, we are uh, wanting to uh, bring the plane in for a landing. And I hope that uh, you will have a sense that we have uh, uh, gone full circle and uh, that there is connection between what we have done. And in particular this evening, we want to think uh, in practical terms about how the church can be effective in the context of uh, contemporary life. And I know that there are uh, pressures when we think about uh, specific strategies for the church. Uh, it reminds me uh, of the story of a man who was marooned on an island. Uh, he had been there for 18 years, but he put his uh, time to good effort. Uh, while he was there, he constructed a model village. And he was out working on his village one day when uh, he heard the sound of a ship and he had saved one flare for this occasion. Uh, he shot it into the air and uh, it was seen and he was rescued. But before he went with his rescuers, he said, oh, I must show you uh, what I've been doing. And so they began to tour the town, and uh, he showed them the post office and the bank, uh, a church. There was a grocery store, a barber shop, and a beauty salon, uh, another church. And the people with him said, why two churches? Oh, he said, this is the one I attend, and this one over here I wouldn't get caught dead in. <laughs> and we do have feelings about church life. And we have, uh, particularly if we have been uh, born uh, into a particular uh, persuasion of faith, or if we have uh, met Christ in a, in a fresh and transforming way, uh, the place, the church, where we have uh, driven our roots down in Christ become very important to us. But I would like to begin uh, this evening by thinking about uh, the mission of the church uh, by suggesting to us that uh, <clears throat> whether we exist in the 1990s or the year uh, 2020 or whether we want to go back in history, uh, that one way to conceive uh, the mission of the church, the presence of the church, is to realize that uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in the beginning, there was order and there was design uh, and there was uh, a plan for how creation uh, could in fact function. We know uh, what has happened to the original design of creation. Uh, it went awry. Instead of the beauty that God had in mind, uh, darkness entered, brokenness came, evil arrived. When we look at the 1990s and think about Canadian society, is it not uh, a good idea for us to think about a culture within, within some definition. And in the culture, we've been saying that there is often disorder and disarray and increasing complexity. 
I would suggest to us that the church in the culture is to bring Christ's redemptive presence and influence. Or another way to say that is, is that it is the mission of the church to restore the intended order of creation. And so when we pray the prayer, the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven, we are defining the purpose of the church within our culture. It is to bring the intended beauty and order of creation into the reality of contemporary society. And so, in a broad sense, the church is then Christ's redemptive presence. We need structures in order to express the mission of Christ. And so we have denominations and local churches. But the purpose of the church is to nurture and equip the people of God to be disseminated in the society, to be dispersed into the world as individuals, as families, uh, into communities, into the workplace, into our schools, and to understand that because the creator of the whole world has concern and compassion for all of creation, the church in a local culture will do well also to be concerned about international and global realities and conditions. Sometimes in evangelical circles, the church is reduced uh, to an agency of saving individuals. That is a critical part of God's revelation for creation, but it is not the whole of God's revelation for creation. And if we simply focus on the evangelistic invitation to invite people to encounter Christ, that will result in reductionism of the gospel. Uh, it will downsize the church and its focus and its energy. It will stifle its creativity. Uh, instead of nurturing innovation, it will somehow uh, move us into a smaller mindset than what God intended when in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And in the fullness of time, Jesus came to invite all of humankind to believe and to know, to taste forgiveness, and to follow as faithful disciples, regardless of what culture that discipleship is expressed in. Now, as we have addressed various subjects uh, during uh, these four sessions. Uh, we have thought about Canadians as committed participants, conditional participants, cultural Christians, and other Canadians who would say, I am a person with no religion. That is, they make no formal association with an organized expression of faith, Christian or uh, other world religions. And it's somehow uh, helpful for us to understand uh, that those committed Christians, those who are at the core of organized church life, uh, those people who clergy love, uh, those people who uh, believe in the mission of the church and give their time and energy and frankly find uh, their, their sense of well-being and their social connectedness and it's where they put their time and their money and their value system shows up there. Committed participants are at the highest level on all of the indicator with the except of I feel God is looking out for me personally. I wouldn't want to hypothesize on such a narrow difference, but maybe the committed feel that the church is looking out for them personally as well as God. And the conditional might be more dependent on God than on the church. But the patterns are what are interesting. It is to say that participation in church life enforces and raises the level 
of belief and attitude and perceived value of the faith. And we know that it also generates some behaviors that are consistent with God's original design for life. There is a sense of morality that is clearer. There are, you know, other expressions of differences that are positive. What is very intriguing is to see that uh, there is uh, so much connection between those who say they have no religion and those who we have defined as cultural Christians. As a reminder, I would uh, want to say to us that uh, 25% of the people who have no religion uh, are really in very positive uh, relational terms with God. It is as if they have disassociated with church life. In their history, you see, they went through periods of times where they became disenchanted with what was going on and somehow they disengaged from organized religion. And then we have the cultural Christians who are hanging on to religious identification. They are the people, even in Baptist churches, who still value having their names on the membership roll, although they never come. It is just that they expect the minister to show up saying glowing things about their spirituality at their funerals. They have feelings for God. But the data is telling us that the cultural Christians are increasingly reflecting more and more the image and likeness of those who have no religion. Now, in McLean's and other publications, when uh, my good colleague and friend, Reg Bibby, writes about the church, uh, he gives a uh, very high acclaim uh, and respect for affiliation. Uh, we have argued about the significance of affiliation uh, for 10 years. Uh, he has not seen this data. I will have to be careful about pride when I show it to him. <laughs> because uh, we, I have been contending that simply, you know, to have a verbal expression of identity uh, without uh, some substance is like carrying, you know, a, a credit card in your pocket for... Uh, Petro Canada, or uh, what's that? Is it the Irving Company? I think that's the one that's down here. You know, you, you carry the card, but you never use it. And so, what is the value of a card that's never used? Pretty soon it is smudged and stained and not worthless. It is still there, but it is not operationalized. And so when McLean's talks about the religiosity of Canadians on their front cover or the expression of spirituality in our modern age, there is often a great virtue made out of privatized spirituality. In fact, Canadians have a strong reputation for being privatized people, of which their religiosity is one of those virtues. I would suggest to us that privatized faith needs to be evaluated. And we need to distinguish between what would be a higher level of faith that we might call personalized faith compared to socialized faith. And Canadians are still being nurtured into socialized faith because spirituality is still a Canadian inheritance. Just as values get passed on, so faith is transmitted from generation to generation. And almost automatically, the children of people who say they are Protestants, of, of parents who say they are Protestants or Catholics, the children end up also saying, I am a Protestant of a particular kind, or I am a Catholic. But can we lower the lens and distinguish between personalized faith and socialized faith? Can we also compare active faith to passive faith? You know, often the Christian faith is described as a relationship. God is conceived as the creator of the universe, but still accessible to all who are created. Christ is the redeemer of life, who invites people into a relationship. Prayer is communication 
that is to nurture the relationship. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper may be mysterious, but the experience engenders life. I would suggest that passive faith is like a dormant friendship, that it turns relationship more into a historical and hypothetical event or reality, and that we somehow can't deny passive spirituality, but we need to affirm active faith as we affirm active and vibrant relationships. Another contrast as we think about privatized faith and its retention in our culture is to realize that it is very legitimate for us to compare public faith to private faith. And we have already mentioned that approximately one out of four Canadians are active in the expression of their public faith. I would suggest that we call church attending Christians in this age visible Christians. They are like a visible minority. They are people who choose uh, to live as members of a minority group in contemporary Canadian society. How else can we conceive the life of the church at this particular point in our time? I want to spend some moments this evening uh, drawing from conclusions uh, from the study of where is a good church. Uh, to tell you how the study was done uh, is uh, to say I was driving down uh, the 401 one morning uh, thinking to myself, uh, I wonder if we could research what healthy churches look like. Uh, could we uh, probe the question, what are the characteristics of effective churches? Uh, I walked in uh, to the office and to my small staff, and I said to them, uh, I had an idea this morning. I saw horror come across their faces. Uh, you know, ideas engender work. Extraordinary energy. I called a researcher in Winnipeg, uh, Erwin Barker, to see if the idea was feasible, and we constructed the design for the project. We began with uh, holding 25 focus groups across the country, inviting representatives from evangelical and mainline churches, lay people, clergy, and academics. One of the things that we found out early in our focus groups is that there is a lot of switching going on in Canadian church life. Ladies and gentlemen, far more switching than evangelism in Canadian church life. And so when we realized we have a lot of switchers, uh, we uh, called up churches that were doing well and asked them to gather people who had been in their churches for less than a year, and we just called them the switchers group. And we talked to them about why they left and why did they appreciate the church they were attending. Uh, several interesting things emerged. Uh, one uh, reality is that 54% of active attenders in contemporary church life have switched denominations. Uh, here we have a look at uh, conservative church attenders the lay clergy, and the academic. And we will note that uh, we have movement not just uh, between conservative churches, but between mainline and evangelical churches. In fact, uh, somewhere in the range of 22% of present conservative church attenders have their religious histories in mainline denominations. Now, what is interesting is, is that when we compare the movement between those who have moved from mainline to evangelicals with those who have moved the other direction, that is, evangelicals to mainline, we have 20% of mainline attenders who have their religious roots in evangelical churches. 
It is almost like we need stoplights out here at the intersections of church changing. Of particular note, uh, the Baptist uh, percentile who evidenced switching was 54%, right on the national norm, and that would not include switching from one Baptist church to another Baptist church, and I'll let you surmise your own conclusions about that. Uh, the other reality is, is that there is very little difference between people who do not have an active church background in terms of being evangelistically invited into mainline and evangelical churches. That is to say, there are as many people coming from out of the world into mainline churches as there are coming out of the world into evangelical churches in terms of percentage basis. Now, we don't want to spend a long time this evening talking about switching. But for those of you who are involved in academic analysis of people movement between churches, may I suggest to you that if you give a high value to affiliation, that is, the cultural Christians who continue to say, I'm a Protestant or Catholic, but do not attend, you can argue for religious stability and say, well, there isn't all that much switching going on. I would suggest that when we look at switching, that we need to look at active Christians. You know, what is the point of someone who claims to be a Baptist but hasn't gone to church with any regularity for the last 15 years to wake up on a Sunday morning and say to themselves, I don't think I'll switch churches today. You know, I don't think I'll decide to go to the United Church today. And people who have been dormant are dormant. It is nonsense to talk about the significance of stability when the sample is people who do not attend and only have intentions of using the church for rites of passage. Now, when we think about church effectiveness and strategies for church effectiveness, it is helpful uh, to acknowledge that much of the existing literature under the title of church effectiveness really deals with church growth. But we, uh, in the research project, became uh, committed to the idea that church effectiveness and church growth should not be conceived as the same thing. There are many churches in the country where congregational numerical growth is not the case. But within these churches, individual members are growing in their personal faith. Now, if we could have ideal scenarios, obviously we would want to affirm both qualitative growth and quantitative growth. That is, increase in development and movement on both the number of people and the quality of growth in the individuals who are present. But if we are going to be fair, uh, is it not appropriate for us uh, to acknowledge the work of the Spirit in churches, uh, whether they are increasing numerically or not, and to affirm what God is doing and uh, avoid taking unnecessary guilt trips because of that? Now, that is not to be negative in terms of an attitude toward increasing numbers of people being encouraged to attend our churches, but it is to try to affirm both, both sides of the coin. Uh, as we move into a look at the specific findings, I, I want to tell you that I know, that you know, that the purity of theory is no match for the mess of reality. And as you look at some of these things, you're going to say to yourself, but what about the uniqueness of my situation? If we had more time tonight, I would like to address a threefold criteria when thinking about church growth and church development. But let me just mention them. It is to say that we continually need to address what's biblical. What is solidly theological as we think about the church. 
But we will also be wise to say not just what's biblical, but also what works. What, in fact, is culturally sensitive and appropriate at a particular point in time. And then we will also be wise to think about what's denominationally valid and appropriate. How can we somehow affirm organizational distinctives in appropriate ways as we think about the shape of the modern church? In the focus groups and then in the survey results where we solicited responses uh, from effective churches, that is, churches that religious leaders identified in their denominations as being healthy and what they would like to see more of, we had 760 people respond that gave us a criteria for the conclusions. Uh, we heard the same messages in the focus groups as what was affirmed in the research response from the surveys that were sent out. Effective churches are built on four cornerstones. And may I say initially that it is the harmonization of these four ministry themes that is creating the synergy for health and effectiveness. And so it's not just emphasizing one dimension of ministry, but rather it is uh, orchestrating uh, the combination of the four. The first pillar uh, that uh, is important for effective church life is that of orthodoxy. Now, by orthodoxy, we are talking about being in touch with truth. Effective churches are affirming the historic essentials of the Christian faith. They are not apologetic about the belief that God exists. They are ready to say that the person of Jesus Christ is unique. They lift up the scriptures and hold the scriptures uh, with the view that God has spoken and revealed uh, his intentions for creation and redemption here. Now, orthodoxy is not an invitation to become excessively focused on specific doctrines. Orthodoxy, in the sense, at least from the research, was um, simply to affirm the basics of the faith. It is not an invitation for ministers to do an eight-part sermon series on Baptist distinctives. Uh, that is not going to incite confidence in the faith in this age. Uh, rather, our distinctives should be used as baseline uh, foundational suppositions uh, for our framework of teaching and emphasis. Uh, orthodoxy, we mentioned in one of the other sessions, is not just about right teaching and affirmation of the existence of truth. It is also about stability. Effective churches are not opening their doors on Easter Sunday and uh, communicating doubt. Uh, they are opening their doors and people are coming and they are celebrating up from the grave he rose. And the sermon title is not Six Possible Options to What Happened to Jesus After He Died. <laughs> it is about celebrating the reality of the faith, the hope of the resurrection, the promise you know, that death has been defeated. It is standing with clarity on the basics of the faith. It is being unapologetic. Rather than seeding doubt, it affirms that God created the world and he is still deeply interested in the world and in people who walk on planet Earth. The second cornerstone is that of community. And you say, well, how do you, in fact, measure such dimensions? Uh, we looked at do you value, how important is it for you to have a sense of belonging, opportunity to be involved, emphasis on the family, re response to the importance of building self-worth and meeting emotional needs. 
Is it not interesting to see the comparison between mainline and conservative and how similar uh, they turn out to be? Now, when we take and look at denominational breakdown on such things as importance of belonging, and remember now, these are re representative responses from participants and particularly committed participants, where the national norm were 83% who say, I ha highly value a sense of belonging. Uh, what community is about? It's about being in touch with people's needs. It is uh, creating an environment where people have a sense of uh, significance, of belonging, of importance. This is my church. You know, when I'm not present, I'm missed. People know me by name. It has that kind of emotional bonding for people. And again, we can see how parallel some of the responses are, whether we talk about uh, the question of belonging or the importance of being involved. Now, when we look at family emphasis, uh, we do begin to see variations on denominationalism uh, having uh, some uh, pronounced areas, particularly for the United Church, uh, where they do not see the church as, um, as critical uh, to uh, the value shaping and uh, uh, the family support compared uh, to other denominations. Now, the, th the third cornerstone is that of relevance. Orthodoxy in touch with truth. Community in touch with people's needs. Relevance in touch with the times. Ladies and gentlemen, over and over again, people said they want a faith that works. They want to go to church on Sunday to receive direction for how to live on Monday. They are interested in connecting the principles of the faith to the realities of life. There is a concern that we find our way through the moral mazes of the modern world, that we understand how to resolve conflicts and move toward reconciliation in families. They're, they're interested, I dare say, more in personal issues than in macro-social problems. You know, the idea of relevance has historically been that we must give ourselves to issues of apartheid and racism and uh, uh, the, the issue of armaments in the world. Now, those need to be addressed as fundamental Christian issues. To ignore justice in this age is to uh, tear uh, a whole... Uh, section of the Bible and say that it does not have merit. But we have gone so personal in our orientation that people say, you know, I, I want to know how to live personally, to resolve problems, and to have specific perspectives that are Christian on such issues that come to the front page of the newspaper, like abortion, same-sex families, and I would like to add things like immigration policy. And, you know, how are we as God's people going to respond to the reconfiguration of universal medical care that we have so treasured uh, as Canadians? Uh, do we have anything uh, to, to say in response to the present political uh, predicament of escalating debt as we think as Christian citizens in these 1990s. People are wanting to connect orthodoxy with relevance. The fourth cornerstone is that of outreach. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to evaluate your own church or your denomination on strength and weakness on these four cornerstones. But before we do that, it is to say that the fourth cornerstone is that of outreach. That is being in touch with the needs of others. Now, uh, Canadians uh, are giving us some interesting messages. We ask them, you know, from your point of view, is numerical growth important? Uh, you can see that we have 7% 
who say, well, numerical growth is really important. Somewhat important, we pick up uh, quite a number of others, and you can see that clergy particularly have vested interests in that particular issue. Uh, laity, you know, who we depend on, you can see that they are uh, lowest in terms of affirming the importance of uh, in numerical growth, and when it comes to not important, they uh, lead the issue. That may give you some clue about motivational patterns on numerical increase. May I just say at this point a very critical insight? What we found is that effective churches are not focusing on church growth as an end in itself. They are experiencing church growth as a result of their whole orchestration of church life. That is, when orthodoxy is affirmed and community is present and relevance is part of the mix, the natural consequence of that is increasing numbers. In fact, what we learned is that churches who decree that the church is a place for people who are not in the pews, that is, that the, that the sole purpose of the church is for outreach, that that becomes a negative mindset in today's churches. It is counterproductive. What we found is, is that effective churches are ministering to the people in their pews and then motivating them with a sense of mission to the need that is beyond and outside. And we see this in terms of when we asked, you know, should the church exist to serve congregational needs or should it exist to serve community needs? Well, on congregation versus community, we have a slight higher indicator for serve who's inside, but where we need to focus is on the invitation to do both, to affirm people in their faith where they are present, but also uh, to respond to community need outside. Now, I said earlier this week that doing research is a lot like doing inductive Bible study. You know, what are people saying what does it mean, and how does it apply? And so when we ask the question, if you move to a new community and you're looking for a new church, what's most important to you? And what did people tell us? Preaching, choice number one. Now, what pillar does preaching connect to? Orthodoxy, primarily. It needs to be more than that, but it focuses, it affirms the truth of the gospel. And evangelism, of course, hooks to which pillar? Outreach. In touch with the times? Relevance. And involvement? Community. Now, when we look further, we see that there are other criteria for looking for a church. And we can see the denomination is still important for approximately 50% of Canadians. Um, more so for mainline than for evangelical. But it is to say to us that when people move, they will look, first of all, to the denomination of their history and choice. But if they do not find a healthy church alternative that's denominationally linked, they will look for a church on this kind of criteria. May I suggest that this drives one critical conclusion in the future of the church in Canadian society. Local churches will lead them. Where we have churches in communities who are able to somehow uh, frame and nourish and nurture uh, vital, effective churches. It will be out of local communities where we will find prototypes for the future of the church. Now, that is not to say that denominational planning is unimportant or that theological education does not have a role to play. But it is to say that when it comes to the future, 
It will be local churches in local communities that, in fact, will find uh, a positive future and develop prototypes uh, that will give us a sense of hope that will encourage us. When we look at this model, it is uh, very easy to think about uh, the tensions in the model. Orthodoxy, of course, pulls us to the reality of God. Uh, relevance pulls us to the issues of the age. Community pulls us toward narcissism. Outreach pulls us toward an external focus. And so balancing those tensions and dealing with those tensions becomes part of the art of leadership in the local church. Now, just as there are tensions, there are invitations to binge out. You know, orthodoxy that is unchecked produces attitudes in people where they become self-righteous exclusivists. Now, these are people who simply say, uh, you know, uh, God has revealed the truth to me, to us. And, you know, there, there's only, there's really only one way. There's God's way and my way. And since my way is God's way, if you don't disagree, obviously I'm going God's way. And that can lead to a very exclusive design for church. It will downsize the, the kingdom to my size. Community can shift us to becoming subculture isolationists. Binging out on relevance can turn us into well-motivated but humanistic social workers. And churches that say, you know, the church exists for people who aren't members. Because the mission of the church is the only focus we should give ourselves to. They will find themselves uh, really in excess on outreach. What we are suggesting is, is that it is the harmonization of the four ministry emphasis that is bringing health and vitality. It is like uh, playing in a small ensemble group. And my, you know, t musical taste buds, uh, I would start uh, with a flute. Uh, that's sort of gracious orthodoxy. Uh, I, I would move uh, to a cello uh, and add to that a piano. And I'll let you provide the fourth instrument for the ensemble. But it is when we have harmonization of these uh, critical elements that make up the whole that we create the possibility for healthy and effective churches. At least that is what the research is telling us. Now, may I ask you, at this point in the address, as we move toward closure, to think about your church. Or, if that's inappropriate, think about your denomination. If that's inappropriate, just think. <laughs> and, and look at these four cornerstones. And on a scale of 1 to 10, evaluate the tone the strength of each ministry emphasis. I would suggest that if it's really healthy and strong and in great shape, you would say, we're an eight on orthodoxy. Uh, if you're 10 or 11, you've binged out. Uh, if you're two or three, uh, it is obviously a place to give attention in terms of future uh, development and increased effectiveness. Remember, orthodoxy in touch with truth, community in touch with people's needs, relevance in touch with the times, and outreach in touch with the needs of others. Now let me express this in another way. The model is somehow denominationally friendly for us because it allows us to bring the personality of our denominations into our worship styles, into our understanding of the faith. And so effective churches can be characterized by four words. Effective churches are 
worshiping communities. Effective churches are learning communities. Effective churches are serving communities. And effective churches are witnessing communities. And you see, when we are serving, we are people of compassion. We are sensitive to needs in our communities. It means that we do needs assessments in our communities, and we move to serve and respond to the needs that are there. As a witnessing community, that's a call to conviction. It is to say that when we combine our orthodoxy with our outreach, that is the conviction side of the faith. But when we have concern for outreach with relevance, that will pull us to the heart of God with the touch of compassion. And so the balance of the, of the, of the model and the tensions that are in us, in a sense, invite us to wholeness, but they protect us from excesses. So as you think about your church and say, is it a healthy worshiping community? Is it a learning community? Is it a serving community? Is it a witnessing community? How would you rate your church on a scale of 1 to 10 around the four pillars? Can I invite you to do that just in a couple of minutes? And then the person next to you, you probably know them by name, but whether you do or not, just sort of give your assessment of your church to the person next to you. Over to you for a few moments. Please do not misunderstand that what we are saying today, that there is one way to do effective ministry in this world. We are simply saying that out of this particular research project in the space of time uh, within the last two years in Canadian society, this is what emerged from our best ability to listen to what people were saying. I think I would be also fair to cite C.S. Lewis. Uh, he said, there are many ways of bringing people into the kingdom, some of which I especially dislike. <laughs> I have therefore learned to be cautious in my judgments. And so although we offer a clear model, it should not be conceived to be the only model. But what I would if I had the opportunity to spend a night with you over a fine meal to talk about this, I've been eating ever since I arrived, by the way. <laughs> uh, I would lobby for a holistic gospel for this age. A gospel that touches the heart and the mind and mobilizes the hands and the behavior with compassion for the needs of people. A gospel that acknowledges human need, that somehow is touched by the divine and the transcendence of the reality of God. A gospel that is big enough to respond to the complexity of the age. Not a downsized gospel, but a gospel that's adequate for the age. May I briefly move us uh, to closure by making a couple other observations. Historically, because the Canadian church was born 
into a Christendom historical reality, we have done church essentially the same since the beginning of modern Canada. We have built buildings, invited people to come, hired clergy, gathered people inside our churches, and said, let's do church. Is it not true that we have channeled somewhere in the area of 90% or more of our energy, our vision, our money, and our creativity into the church gathered? Now, we need to continue to gather the church and to have rich worship and to have a learning community and a community that is mobilized for mission. But I would appeal to us to redeploy some of our energy, resources, and vision increasingly outside the building. Now, in evangelical circles in particular, we have also encouraged ministry that calls the people of God to lifestyle evangelism. That is, to mobilize uh, people in relationships to make sense out of who God is and what Christ has done. Uh, it is not structured. It's dependent on uh, individual interaction and the Spirit of God working in that. But I'd like to ask you a question. I'd like you to think about the people that you will worship with uh, on a regular basis. If you're going to be in church on Sunday morning, can you envision your congregation? Do you see those people? You know, the rows, the pews, the people who are there? I want you to think about those people. What percentage of those people do you think get up on Monday morning with a sense that they have been called to the mission of Christ? Or what percentage of those people do you think have the social skills to engage people in meaningful dialogue? Uh, what percentage of those people do you think have uh, the poise and uh, the uh, intentionality to raise issues of faith in the context of natural relationships? Uh, what percent? Uh, I'm content to wait. What percent? Eight, ten percent? Five percent? Five, ten? Now, I have a question for us. If when we sit and reflect and say we have somewhere five, ten, perhaps fifteen percent of the people of God who we can expect to potentially be involved in lifestyle evangelism, why is it for the past 20 years that we have exhorted and guilt-ridden people to be involved in lifestyle evangelism. Why do we do that when we step back and realize that 85% or 90% are not going to be involved in that? Is it because we like inducing guilt trips for people? Is it because we believe we must call everyone to the ideal? Now, I am someone who believes in lifestyle evangelism have even had a few things to say about that. Seek to practice that. But I'm wondering if we would be more sensitive and effective if we were gift-centered in our approach to people rather than seeking to mobilize everyone to do the same thing. I'll leave that as a question. If we could look at a third alternative in terms of ministry motivation and ministry modeling, this would be best described by Tilipa in his book, Unleashing the Church. Uh, it is not to simply leave ministry initiative to random and interpersonal, but to create some structures uh, that would assist people to express the vision that they have for God. 
my candid sense is that we don't have enough people here. We need to help the people who are here, but not expect everyone to be active here and just accept the reality of that. But we can mobilize more energy by creating ministry initiatives outside the building. I mean, it might be, for example, uh, where you have... Uh, do people curl in the Maritimes? Uh, it, 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 I thought that was a possibility. Uh, it, you know, that, that you would, that, a, that uh, a couple or a man or a woman would sponsor a church curling uh, event uh, just once a year. And the community is invited and curlers are invited. And, and at the end of that, uh, of that day of, of uh, enjoyment of each other, with a touch of competition, you know, to keep it Canadian, uh, that, that we have a, a banquet at the end that is done with a sense of class and, you know, God's love for leisure is addressed or God's touch on, on recreation where we bring a Christian perspective that celebrates life. That could be the one outreach event for this one couple for the whole year. Or it is to mobilize people into neighbor link as we're seeing across the country. Connecting people who have a concern to love their neighbors and helping them respond to people with specific needs. You see, establishing structures outside for business people downtown, sponsoring luncheons on ethics, moving into community centers, doing uh, a, a three series on transmitting values to your children, and bringing the work of God and the touch of Christ outside the building and mobilizing more people into active service involvement in Christ's mission. We have already said that we have committed participants, we have conditional participants. One vision for the church is to invite all people who come to worship to make a contribution somewhere. And if I was thinking about being a pastor these days, I think somewhere on the wall would be the slogan, everybody a contributor. And what we would do, we would encourage people who want to serve inside the institutional church to make their contribution there. And people who have a vision for lifestyle evangelism, the commitment would be to equip them to somehow be used by God in significance there. And people who have some vision for the church's response to the world or some innovative move in response uh, to social justice issues or evangelism or human need that we would mobilize people there but whoever comes into the body of Christ it is to say you have been touched by God you are gifted by God we exist to help you make a contribution to God and your world everybody a contributor one of the difficulties, ladies and gentlemen, is that our churches look too much like each other. They look like they have come out of Xerox machines. They have not been contextualized for their communities. They have not been diversified for the visions that can be a part of the future. May God give us a sense of trust to move to where we have not gone. If I was direct you, to direct you biblically tonight in terms of the four cornerstones, we could do an exposition on Acts chapter 2, 42 and following, where the New Testament church was involved in all four of those functions. But earlier today, I read from John 5, verses 1 through 11. It's the incident where the disciples had been fishing all night. Their nets were empty. And Jesus said, push back out into the deep water. You see, they've been having, having an experience like uh, the Newfoundland fishermen out fishing and coming up with empty nets. And often in our church life, we feel like we have been fishing and coming up with empty nets. I'm not suggesting that the future is going to be easy. It's going to be difficult to come up with full nets in Canadian society. I think it's something like TSN, the sports network, maintaining their audience 
without National League hockey or Major League Baseball. I'm not proposing that it is going to be easy. There are going to be challenges, but we need to get out into the deep water. We need to let our nets down in places that we have not let them down. We need to get out into the deep, water beyond church buildings. We need to get into the society, into, into some new rivers and some new streams, and run some new risks and navigate into some new territory to find some new channels, believing that the God of history will go with us into the unknown. In this world, we are being faced with various expressions of specialization. Above all else, as we go into charted waters or uncharted waters, can we remember that we go to the dentist to get our teeth fixed? We consult lawyers for legal opinions. We go to grocery stores to buy our food. We go to banks to negotiate mortgages and cash checks. We go to service stations to purchase our gasoline. When people go to church, they come to get connected with God. When the people of God are mobilized into ministry, it is to lift up the person of Christ and the creator of the universe. You know, people go to church to get involved in their communities of faith, to get direction for living in the complex world, to somehow be reminded that the world is bigger than their exalted self-interests. Linked to the mind of Christ, touched by the spirit of the living God, we can live in this world with confidence. We can be a clear voice in a multi-voice society. And we can say again that the God who created the world is in perpetual motion with us. May we sense him, enjoy him, and follow him. Amen.